Yeah, I, I really like this question. So I think that what's important is that it it means to me at least that as you're aging and as you reach, you know, 60, 70, 80, you're still able to do the things that you like. So aging obviously comes with some slowing down, um, but we still want to be able to do things that make us happy, make us feel connected, um, bring joy into our lives. And so in addition to sort of still being able to do certain things, you know, maybe we're not going to be able to run as fast as we once did, but we could still take part in a community 5K, right? So That's things right. can still bring us joy. The second thing that I think is really key is that we want to be delaying aging related diseases as long as possible. So some of this is under genetic control, but somewhere between 35 and 50% of aging related diseases, if you're talking about something like dementia or Alzheimer's disease, does have lifestyle factors in it. And so what we really want is, you know, if you can, if you have genetics that sort of predisposition you to certain aging related diseases, if you get those diseases at 85 instead of 75, that's 10 great quality years of life that you've had. And so it's, it's this combination of still having an active and engaged and happy life and also putting off anything that's going to take away from, from that life, lifestyle um, as long as possible. No, oh, amazing. Thank you for that. Uh, another important question that I'm posing to you, how can communities and governments promote healthy aging throughout the world? And do you think collaboration is key in communities, professionals, hospitals, local agencies and private organizations working together for the benefit of the older persons? And what things do you see that need to be implemented or addressed within our societies? Right. So um, that's a lot of question. I'll start with yes. the beginning of it. So how do how do communities and governments promote healthy aging? And um, I think the key thing is, is this needs to start early in life. So we want to build healthy physical, healthy mental and healthy social societies. You can't suddenly one day wake up, say I'm 70 and now I'm going to be healthy. Right. Like all of this takes time and setting up. Um, particularly if we're talking about social, setting up social, social infrastructure that where, as you age and people come in and out of your life and you have major life events, that that is still there is important. Um, maintaining health and well-being both physically and mentally throughout your life is key so that when you get to these ages, you are putting off um, sort of complications as, as long as possible. Um, and so what, what we really want communities and governments to be doing is to be incentivizing this and actually making it easy. Um, and so when we think about collaboration in communities, professionals, hospitals, local agencies, I mean, obviously, a lot of this you do want coming from the government, you want community infrastructures, you want support for that. Yes. Um, but then there's a lot of, you know, a lot when we're talking about loneliness, or actually many other aging related issues, identifying older people in need, if they're socially isolated, or if they aren't an active part of the community, like that's going to be neighbors who notice um, people who are very local. It's not necessarily the hospitals who are going to notice this until someone shows up. And so there's a huge um, aspect for the community in helping identify people who need additional support, but then also in providing that basic support. So when we start thinking about um, different levels of support, both physically and mentally, you know, the community can go a long way for keeping people in a, a state of general well-being. We can get to the point then when we're sick, where we either have, you know, mental illness or physical illness that we need to go see a doctor. But well-being is something that by having support in the community, activities in the community, places where people feel like they belong in the community, it can be quite beneficial for creating sort of this, this overall state of well-being for older people. That's right. And I think, you know, a lot of community agencies, you know, around the world, uh, in your neighborhoods, through church groups, through uh, senior programs are trying to, you know, connect people either online now during COVID, or hopefully <laughs> going down the road face to face. Um, you know, even people, I think some research has, has noted that even people going to large buildings or to senior centers still feel kind of lonely um, and a bit isolated when they're going to programs. So um, I think a lot of people, perhaps with mental health or older persons, they feel more comfortable, I think, in going into smaller groups. And, you know, we've seen this through Mosaic Home Care, where obviously we can't have larger groups in our center. And what we found is that people have connected, you know, through our programs, which have been going on for 10 years, and now have 
started connecting with those people that they have become friendly with. And now they're doing things outside of Mosaic, you know, connecting for teas or walking to the park or uh, special occasions. So it's, it's quite interesting to see how a community is formed within a community as well. Um, I think as well, I just want to ask you about ageist attitudes, um, you know, that have become institutionalized in community structure and planning. And, you know, we do need to change this. 